Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel. It sure is chilly out in this forest, and it's nighttime, and it's a little spooky. It's October. Kind of reminds me of uh, that game, Slender, the Eight Pages. What? Welcome back, and happy almost Halloween. Today is voted on by my patrons. We're doing an in-depth video about all of the different Slender games, or at least the ones that I think have the most cultural impact and importance to the development of the Slender Man character. But first, let's try and get on the same page. Now, most of you probably already know this, but it's worth setting up. Slender Man is a creepypasta turned full-on urban myth. His abilities and appearance vary, but most commonly he's known as a tall, thin man in a suit with white skin and no face. He has a supernatural abilities that he uses to stalk his prey and drive them insane. Or at least that's the basics. To understand the Slenderman character more, we're gonna need to talk about some internet history. As many of you know, the Slenderman character was created by Eric Knudsen, aka by his online pseudonym, Victor Surge. He first appeared on the Something Awful forums in 2009 on a contest for supernatural and spooky photoshops. The Slenderman quickly grew attention, having a whole backstory included, and the eerie quality of the photos making things seem unsettlingly real. The Slenderman was always just in the background, and the image quality was just low enough that you weren't sure what you were looking at, what this figure really was. Victor Surge created the character using inspiration from from Lovecraftian stories, particularly with the inclusion of Slenderman sprouting tentacles, the Mothman legend, and the work of Zach Parsons, an editor and writer on Something Awful. Slenderman is not wholly unique, and it's clear to see other characters similar to him in popular media, the biggest to me that stands out being Michael Myers, the white-faced pure force of evil incarnate stalking his victims in the night. Now, exactly who or what Slenderman is or what his abilities are varies from person to person. His adaptations have taken on a life of their own, but commonly he can teleport and has the ability to sprout tentacles. Early on, he was very violent, stringing people's organs up in the trees and giving them slender sickness, a combination of paranoia, nausea, and bleeding. As more people expanded the lore and interpreted the character, especially with the likes of Marble Hornets, the ability to recruit proxies and cause distortions to video and audio became commonplace. There's a school of thought surrounding the slender character known as Surgism, which looks to only follow the lore officially set by the creator himself, but at this point, Slenderman has a life of his own. Nowadays, Slenderman is not as much of the cultural icon as he used to be. He's still recognizable, but he's mostly used as the butt of jokes nowadays. Your mom is so <laughs> stupid! She got ripped apart by Slender. Part of this is due to the sort of cringy subculture he existed in with a lot of creepypastas and then, you know, the oversaturation of him making him less scary with things like Slenderman. But the thing that really killed the Slenderman was going mainstream. Technically, the 2018 Slenderman movie was not the first Slender movie. Always Watching was a 2015 feature-length film created based on the Marble Hornets web series, but that movie was critically panned. Slenderman 2018 was doomed from the start, but it didn't help that it was a terrible movie. See, by the time the movie came out in 2018, Slenderman was well past his prime, and the real-life tragedy associated with the character, the 2014 stabbing in Wisconsin, which was thankfully non-fatal, meant Slenderman was definitely a tricky topic to cover in a mainstream movie. And then the trailers come out, and it's about a bunch of teenage girls. Not a good look, even including a scene in the trailer where a girl stabs herself. Classy. In fact, it was such a bad look that many theaters, especially those in some areas of Wisconsin, banned the movie from playing at all. And again, it's not like the movie was any good. So along with the terrible PR, terrible content, and the revival of a character probably five or six years too late, Slender Man is basically history. But there's a part of the character that I haven't even talked about yet. Part of Slender Man that probably had the most cultural impact of anything and changed indie horror and games forever. The Slender Man games. Shit. June 26th, 2012. 
Parsec Productions, run by Mark Hadley, releases Slender the Eight Pages. It's very simple on release. No menu, just a darkness, and then a forest. Quiet Forest Ambience plays in the darkness, lit only by a small flashlight. One simple message. Collect all eight pages. And so indie horror was changed forever. What this game did for the modern Let's Play format cannot be overstated. Pretty much all of the conventions of the Let's Play format were formed during this time through this game. The game was easily accessible, being extremely simple with low graphics, meaning almost anyone could hop on and record themselves getting scared shitless. It was made for easy content from a creator side. You don't even need to be good at carrying the viewer's attention through interesting commentary. Just scream when the white man pops on screen. The draw towards the scared reactions ended up popularizing some of the most important parts of Let's Play uh, formatting today, like the face cam. People wanted to see you scream when the scary man popped up. This accessibility really is the strength of Slender the Eight Pages, and why it was so successful. Gameplay content wasn't just commentary videos over Black Ops 2 gameplay. Anyone could make a Let's Play and be entertaining, and everyone wanted to. It was like Pokemon Go, everyone wanted to be a part of the current cultural moment. Now of course, this game didn't create the Let's Play format. Amnesia is an even earlier example of the scary game Let's Play format, but Slender popularized it, and ended up boosting the careers of household names in the gaming world, like Markiplier and PewDiePie. Slender is, in my view, one of the last viral sensations. Sure, other games have come along like FNAF, but they're more insular in a way that Slender the Eight Pages wasn't. Slender infiltrated every community and was at the tail end of when things could go viral on the internet. We're not really at a point where viral is a thing anymore. Things get hundreds of millions of views all the time that nobody knows anything about because their communities are so separate, but Slender really was everywhere. Now eventually, the game added a menu with links to more lore about the Slender Man like Marble Hornets and added some other other modes like daylight mode and Give me but essentially the game stays the same. You must walk from landmark to landmark in a forest park looking for eight pages as Slenderman stalks you. Slenderman gets more aggressive as you collect more pages and your flashlight slowly gets dimmer and if you get too close or look at him for too long you're dead. Very simple and very effective to a point. Like I said, Slender the Eight Pages is great to watch. Getting on with some friends and taking turns getting scared on some dark night, or just watching your favorite YouTuber scream every time the Vine Boom sound effect plays, or even just playing it by yourself can be really scary and effective. The starting ambience being really realistic forest sounds really draws you in, and as the ambience stacks, it really builds the tension. It's great, but actually trying to beat it as something other than just a quick spook it is not fun. Once you get the formula and can see past the spooky sounds and silhouette, it's actually really frustrating and is the beginning of a problem a lot of Slender games have. The formula is really simple, and a part of that is a strength, but it's also a weakness. Trying to make something so simple be difficult can lead to problems. It's possible to do effectively, but the 8 pages does not. See, navigating around the Slender Man is actually pretty easy after you begin to understand the mechanics, and that makes you lose a lot of the fear. So how do they keep it difficult? The flashlight. It is nearly impossible to see anything without the flashlight. It adds tension in the beginning, but if you actually want to try and beat the game, it adds a whole nother level of frustration. As you play, the flashlight gets dimmer, and by page 5, it's nearly useless. Add to that the fact that the map is huge and every single tree is the exact same asset, and you end up completely lost and unable to navigate anything. I had a map of the game on my phone while I was playing and still found myself completely disoriented, so instead of being scared or even just feeling challenged, you just give up because there's no way to salvage your run and you just end up going to the Slender Man yourself to end it. So as a fun experimental horror project, it's great. As a full game, not so much. But the concept was easy to replicate, and very interesting, and of course everyone loves to capitalize on what's currently popular. It led to an explosion of iterative fan games, which at this point is a staple for any successful indie game. FNAF, Baldi's, Undertale all have a huge fan game scene, but Slender is what kicked off this custom. Using the same format and concept, but adding a twist or your own spin, or sometimes straight up copying it. Some of them were shitty, that's true, but others legitimately improved upon the concept. Which moves us to our next game. Slenderman Shadow. Now, as far as I can tell, Slenderman Shadow was first created using FPS Creator. It's an old game development suite that was very janky and eventually turned into a sequel called Game Guru. I used FPS Creator a lot when I was younger, so when I saw some old videos on Slenderman Shadow, I recognized all those assets, that lighting engine, and that walk cycle. I'd recognize that menu backdrop anywhere. There were some pretty good horror games made on FPS Creator if I remember correctly. I kind of missed that vibe, almost similar to the Source game feeling. It looks like Slenderman Shadow 
Shadow was released with each map separately created on FPS Creator, but eventually the game was ported to Unity with all the maps. Slenderman Shadow was great for Let's Players. Like I said, each map was released individually, so there was some hype buildup and a good amount of content spaced out for each new release that someone could make an episode on. FNAF did something very similar with all its sequels coming out so quickly in the beginning. It was the same easy formula to make content for, they were much higher quality than the other Slender fan games at the time, and the content just kept on coming. Now, as a game, I think Slenderman Shadow improves a lot from the eight pages. The maps are a little more maze-like and less open, which removes the annoyance of the forest from the eight pages and focuses the fear of the bathroom area from the eight pages, which I think we can all agree is the scariest part. Each map changes things up a little, enough to keep it fresh. Teddy bears, keys, there's voice acting this time, it's... Santa? It's fun. The flashlight is really where it improves the most though. The FOV is very low, which is annoying at times, it feels like you have tunnel vision. If, you, if it's not 90 FOV... Just throw the whole thing in the garbage. But the actual mechanic is great. If you leave the light on for too long, it turns itself off and has to recharge before you can turn it back on. It's possible to get around without the light, but seeing pages is impossible and keeping track of Slenderman is really difficult. So it actually adds an interesting level of balance to the gameplay. Oh, and the glow sticks are fun. It's not without flaws. There are definitely times where Slenderman gets you and you go, what? Again, trying to add difficulty to this concept is a little hard, so in this case, a lot of the times it feels like Slenderman just teleports directly in front of you or gets you through a wall. If they had added a mechanic where the flashlight actually has an effect on Slenderman more directly, I think that could have been interesting. It isn't perfect, but it definitely has more total playtime of having fun than Slender the Eight Pages. What Slenderman Shadow really did, though, was show people that the Slenderman concept could be more than just five quick minutes of gameplay, and little sprinkles of voice acting and story showed that there was more to this concept. And with that introduction, Haunted Memories took it full throttle. Originally released as Haunt, the real Slender game, this game looked amazing, especially for the time. This was before the era of Unreal Engine 4 games that take minimal effort to create something that looks decent. So clearly a lot of work went into this apparent overhaul of the original concept. It also added new mechanics like the portfolio and flashlight batteries. Eventually, inspired by the announcement of Slender the Arrival, the game was changed to Haunted Memories to avoid issues with the real Slender game title, and was overhauled again. The original demo was modified and turned into chapter one of what was supposed to become a long series of narrative chapters. This game really impressed people. It felt different from other Slender games at the time, and because there was no real triple A alternative to a Slender game at the time, the quality and the promise of this game really made an impact. It grew and grew, and it didn't take long for this new Haunted Memories version of the game to be greenlit on Steam, people waiting with bated breath as to what a really high quality narrative Slender game could look like. Unfortunately, after only two chapters, Haunted Memories was abandoned by the developers. I feel like the game just added too much and it was hard to juggle it all. It also attempted to establish an origin for the Slenderman, which ended up being received fairly poorly. Slenderman's backstory in this game is essentially a man named Mark Slender. He was burned by Waffen SS troops in a bunker and I guess he turned into the Slenderman. I definitely admire what it attempts. It really seemed like the making of a AAA quality horror game and the graphics and atmosphere are amazing, especially looking at the other Slender games of the time. And playing it for a little bit of time definitely shows that the concept can be a Effective. Haunted Memories showed that there was more to be done with the concept, and showed that there was a real quality to be found in the Slender format, a way of expanding even further. Unfortunately, its lifetime was short, but where it left off, Slender the Arrival picked up. Developed by Blue Isle Studios in collaboration with Mark Hadley and Victor Surge, Slender the Arrival was the official game adaptation, as you know the creator was involved, and the official sequel to Slender the Eight Pages. An actual full studio production for a Slender game, promising a full story, a full experience, and Mark Hadley, aka Parsec Productions, was back on the audio. Arguably, the ambience of Slender the Eight Pages was one of the most iconic and most effective parts about it, so the entire original soundtrack for The Arrival was composed by Mark Hadley. While Slender the Arrival did not get the same explosive reaction as Slender the Eight Pages, this is definitely the second most famous Slender game. Everyone who you imagine would have played it probably did. It definitely created a splash in the horror Let's Play scene as an official AAA horror title based on the biggest horror sensation in years that came from an indie background. This game is the definition of a mixed bag. I will say this though, when it comes to applying a narrative to Slender Games, The Arrival definitely did the best job. 
That's not to say it was perfect, but it was a narrative that was followable and had a pretty clearly defined beginning, middle, and end. Essentially, the game takes place right after Slender the Eight Pages, or partially in parallel. You play as the best friend of Kate, the girl from Slender the Eight Pages, trying to track her down. Interesting note, in Haunted Memories, you can hear a scream that is also supposed to be Kate, or whatever the name of the Eight Pages girl in that game is supposed to be. You follow this narrative by trekking through legitimately beautiful environments and sometimes watching old tapes from other people, like Kate herself. When it comes to presentation, this game does not lack. The music and ambience is fantastic, the sound effects are, for the most part, really spooky. The graphics, even all these years later and with the relatively small budget, still hold up because they have a very specific style. It's not that they're cartoonish, but it relies heavily on cinematic lighting that still looks great. This game does, however, fall back on a lot of the same stuff. Each section is essentially a derivative of collect all eight pages, from pages to generators to windows and doors. Despite being barely two hours, it definitely feels repetitive. Each section thematically feels unique, but it can definitely get a bit frustrating. Some of the concepts are fun, I like the Kate tape, and the generator room one... Okay, let's talk about that for a second. I think this generator level perfectly encapsulates the game. When I first played this section, I was legitimately terrified. It's just wandering in a place with an enemy that also just... What the fuck? This is seriously fucking me up right now. I'm actually so scared. I hate this. Boom! <gasps> Holy shit. Ah, hey man. Essentially, to power up an elevator, you must explore a facility and turn on the generators. Inside, one of Slender's proxies chases you, who you can stun by focusing the flashlight's beam on them. Now, that isn't super difficult on its own, although that sort of free roamish chase sequence setup is definitely one of the most tense formats in a horror game for me personally. But Slender Man is also around, becoming more active as you turn on more generators, cutting off your escape routes from the proxy. And like I said, my first attempt at this sequence, I was scared as shit. But after the second or third attempt, while still stressful, I started getting flashbacks to Slender the Eight Pages and Slenderman Shadow. This sequence could have been relatively easy, but still terrifying and a memorable part of the game. But instead, to pad the game's already short runtime, they do the thing I was talking about before, making the game frustratingly unfair to make it more difficult. Slenderman can basically just teleport directly in front of you at any time, ending your run, or cornering you without any way to escape. And it's always right when you're at the end, so your failed attempts are drawn out until the end, making everything just take way longer as you try to get back to where you were when you failed last time. It's really disappointing because I was stunned by how effective it was on a first run, but it quickly became frustrating when I realized, oh, it's just gonna get unfair at the very end every time to extend the game's length. I was really, if I would have beat it the first time, I would have been like, this section was really good. But I'm just now realizing how like annoying they set this up. On the flip side of that though, the opening 8 pages sequence has the opposite problem. While definitely less annoying than the actual 8 pages game to beat, it's still easy to get lost and some landmarks don't even have pages, or at least not in any place that were easy to find. So the actual gameplay part of this is frustrating and sort of boring, but thank god if you take too long to find all the pages, it just ends the section prematurely and you're able to move on, so at least they understand that. I think the most disappointing thing though is the ending. It's sort of anticlimactic. I get they were trying to go in maybe a cliffhanger ending direction, but it felt like it either should have ended 20 minutes ago or had an extra 30 minutes. Most of the issues I had with the game were shared by other people. The reception was mixed, with it definitely being the best of its breed, but still having a slew of of issues, not the least of which were bugs and polish issues. In the end though, I still think Slender the Arrival is probably the best of the bunch. It's not perfect, but it is the official adaptation, and it's pretty effective, and it's longer playtime means it's a nice for a nice dark night that you can play through with some friends. It's not perfect, but it's one of the more effective adaptations of the Slenderman concept. And being official, I feel like there wasn't a lot else to be said about Slenderman, and Slender the Arrival was like the first nail in Slenderman's coffin. It still wasn't the end yet, though. Okay, one last game I want to cover here really quick. Slender Rising is a mobile adaptation of a Slender game, and honestly, it's pretty good. It was made on the Unreal Engine before the days of Unreal Engine 4, so that was still a pretty rare thing. The graphics look good, it's simple and effective. It doesn't overdo anything. You tap to move, so you're not covering the screen with your fingers the whole time. It has a helpful arrow to point you in the direction of the pages or signs, and a fun little escape slender mechanic where you have to swipe on the screen. The graphics are good for a mobile game, but aren't flashy. It has good audio, good atmosphere, 
atmosphere, it's fun and spooky, and that's really all you need from a Slender game. I saw in some of the reviews that people wanted the day mode removed, but honestly, I like the day mode better. It's a really creepy Silent Hill vibe. I don't know, I just think you guys should take a look back at it. I remember a lot of nostalgia from this game back in 2013, and it's still pretty fun. So what do I think of the games review-wise, I guess? I think the two best games here are Slender The Arrival and Slender Rising. While The Arrival does have some issues, it is the most definitive adaptation. It has a level of qualities the others just don't. And Slender Rising is a really quick and effective Slender game that has just a unique enough feel to feel refreshing in a way with some of the controls and the escape gimmick. Then I'd say Slender Man Shadow is on the next level of quality, with the original eight pages and haunted memories being the lowest on the list. The eight pages is iconic, of course, but the fact that it was the first experiment with this really shows. It did not have the privilege of seeing what did and did not work. And Haunted Memories is a good concept, but it feels a little convoluted, and of course it was never finished. Any of them work well for a good quick scare, but the arrival takes a bit more commitment. Slenderman Shadow is a much more streamlined adaptation, while the Eight Pages is definitely a classic. Haunted Memories is more if you're looking for good atmosphere and an example of what could be done with the concept, and Slender Rising is perfect for just a quick spook. Now, despite the varying degrees of quality of these games, Slender Man is still a very important character in gaming as a whole. He changed the face of what gaming and gaming online looks like. On YouTube, while Amnesia was an early contender, Slender the Eight Pages was what kicked off the horror game Let's Play scene, and arguably the entirety of the Let's Play scene as we know it. Face cam and a longer form format that benefited from the game being based on a run instead of the reaction compilation style videos. The format as we know it today was formed by Slender, and while collectathons aren't wholly unique, the specific Slender formula has completely changed the face of indie horror forever. From more direct adaptations like Slendy Tubbies to games that are from completely unrelated concepts like Baldi's Basics and The Joy of Creation, the formula was so effective that it spread into every facet of indie gaming. In the present, Slender Man has moved on past even the height of its cringe. Even as the butt of a joke, he's not really around. Slender Man is not just past his prime out of the spotlight, he's left the building packed up and gone home for the most part, but clearly not without a legacy. I think it's more fair to say that if there was a Mount Rushmore of horror characters, Slender Man would definitely be up there. Although I guess that would just be an oblong shape at that point, like an egg. All right, that is my take on the Slender Man games. Despite being past his prime, I still think the Slender Man is a very effective character, and I still have a lot of nostalgia from that time. Thank you for sticking with me, and happy almost Halloween. I've got a big project dropping on Halloween. Uh, you can also check out my second channel and my Twitch and Twitter for various things uh, about when I'm streaming. So uh, yeah, I will see you all next time.